that was the briefest of introductions. Um, so I, I want to thank uh, Buck for giving us this opportunity to have a more sustained conversation than we usually manage yeah, in kind wonderful. of choppy paragraphs and emails and, and, and so on. And um, to say that I've been intrigued by Tony's work uh, since I saw the Berlin Biennial and um, the, the kind of different stratas of engagement that come together in the work. But I think my, my very initial response was feeling flattered that an artist thought that I was capable of looking, listening, reading and thinking simultaneously, which is not something that happens all that often in the art world. And the, the kind of sense that um, one did not necessarily need to kind of, of bring everything and streamline it together into one final message. And the, the sort of, of, of the, the stretching that the fragmentation of the work produces is something that I think very valuable. So we've kind of, of um, located a few points that we want to visit, but Thank I also you. want to say one thing. There's, in the, co in the background, there's a particular reference that we both share, and that is Kojo Eshun's um, January 2018 memorial lecture to Mark Fisher. Uh, this is something that you can uh, listen to on YouTube. On YouTube. Yeah. Um, so the, the sort of, but it's one of those moments in which a very great tragedy, the suicide of our friend and colleague, Mark Fisher, brought together a very particular kind of communion and fellowship. And, um, and this is something that both of us have found certain kind of, 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 of joint references in. So this is just in the background and will, you know, here and there be referred to, but you have access to it should you wish to look at it. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, there was something really transformative um, about that talk and also kind of about the fact that, yeah, it's on YouTube of all places. You know, um, maybe we we're going to talk some about quote unquote archives and what's in them and perhaps maybe for me a little bit about maybe what's not in them, say, if I'm thinking about a work like Black Celebration. But it was just a really amazing to me that I was not able to attend that event and yet I had heard about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just sort of looked for it and there it was. And it um, really intrigued me and really became kind of really central for me because I was about to do a project at Goldsmiths and, you know, I'm not really sort of hyper-modernist in terms of doing site-specific works, but often I try to think, if that's possible, about the context that I'm working in. And so questions of, you know, how would this work in this location and other models, you know, for that? And I was like, well, the talk is one model, but what would happen if you extended it, or what would happen if you were able to displace and redistribute it in certain ways? And it just seemed um, to speak to my practice and concerns in very, very specific ways, but we can talk about that too as we come back to it. So your, your work comes about in a variety of ways that have to do with um, with sort of, of working with media, but also assembling a variety of archives. And um, the, the, the sort of, of, I always recognize work that is a conjunction of um, researching and teaching and um, the, the sort of imperative to explicate things and the, the, um, the need to kind of, of provide tools for seeing the work world critically. So I was going to ask you about 
archiving, because archives are supposed to be polite and dusty and sort of be passive and be, you know, excavated. And your archives are stormy and noisy and passionate and almost overwhelming. And so I wanted to ask about archives. Yeah, I, I was, it's really interesting that you bring this up in particular because, yeah, I think it has maybe something to do with my historical relation to archives and the things within them. Um, to some extent, I think this direction that I've been pursuing off and on for about 20 years kind of comes out of maybe certain dissatisfactions or questions or qualifications about archives in a certain way. Um, I often imagine things that should be archived that are not. Um, I was at great pain, say, in a work like Black Celebration to disassemble the original material in its you know, kind of condition as it was left to me, to try to do something else with that material, um, to point to perhaps gaps in the visual record, um, perhaps to point to certain limitations in terms of the context, desires, and expectations of certain classes of imagery. And um, I would even say there is a part of me that kind of as almost property in, in a kind of intellectual sense, the, the relationships around the archive, let's say for traditional um, film and televisual practices kind of bothered me. Um, so it was kind of like, yeah, I want access to archival materials, but then I see all the limitations around them and all the gaps in them. And so it was kind of also kind of movement away from formal archives to something more mm -hmm. informal. Yeah. Um, I, I like to gather things. It's kind of, um, it's almost like, well, you know, there's my music collection, which is one thing. And then there, you know, if I'm researching something, I often don't go to traditional archival sources. I've kind of developed, especially over the last couple of decades, you know, just finding articles, um, you know, sometimes from books, sometimes from academic journals, but often things from newspapers and magazines. And I just sort of collect them, you know, as PDFs and store them on drives. And then, you know, occasionally when I'm working on a project, I will actually revisit and call through that material. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I know most scholars, you know, go to physical archives. And I think there's something about my relationship maybe to the institutionality and the histories of these things that it's sort of like, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm always at pains to say, is there something more commonplace? Is there something um, more like um, that, that one could kind of construct out of things that would pass through the hands and eyes of other people without resorting to kind of specialized collections? Even though I'm... Humble? Yeah, maybe, you know, in that sense, or, you know, a kind of perverse wish that um, you could start anywhere, that you don't have to be specialized in a certain sense or professional, even in your address to these questions, you know, or problems, that you can kind of almost start anywhere, you know, and, and take kind of commonplace, you know, texts and um, begin to work with those. Because I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I guess I have a kind of suspicion about certain things, including, you know, visual images, and maybe we can talk a little bit about, about that, since, since that topic was broached a little earlier. But, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of, for me, it's like things that might be, um, that, that one might see, you know, and might have seen, and might have read. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a, interested in things that supposedly have been read, and, you know, it's sort of like, then you ask yourself, well, if this were properly read, you know, how exactly, you know, do we find ourselves, you know, in certain re repetitions, um, certain elisions, um, certain, what is it, um, 
post-factual moments, you know. It's like, how do those things happen? And so, yeah. But there's another, there's another aspect to this archiving, which is archives separate events and trajectories, right? So each one is dedicated to the kind of full representation and, and documentation of something. Whereas the, the sort of, of, in your work, there's a, a relationality that gets set up between catastrophes mm. and the the sort of, of and the catastrophes are an interrelational field in which there's the the archive doesn't separate them it echoes other archives that cast their shadow over this and that and i think maybe black celebration was you know one of the the um, kind of moments in which all these different archives kind of of came together and, and, and started casting shadows over one another. So there's, there's, it does almost the opposite of what an archive does, because an archive isolates. You're right, and I, I think it, my approach to things tends to, I don't know, splinter or complicate things that you know, might seem to be coherent and whole. Um, and maybe that's because you know, I'm, I'm kind of always kind of trying to implicate the gap you know, the things that aren't visualized, um, even if they're not, um, because I, I tend not also to explicate in a kind of classical sense, um, you know, to fill the gap, say, with proper language or with descriptive language. There's always a kind of desire, I think, on my part to create a kind of parallel to the visual, um, at least, say, in, in a work like... Um, I think it's true also in a strange way in Fade to Black, but definitely in Black Celebration, I was interested in a kind of, I don't know, you would say perhaps one way of looking at it is a kind of counter reading or a kind of legibility that somehow would never appear in a documentary source. You know, it's it's kind of, um, kind of a negative or a kind of disarticulation of the, kinds of like sounds and arguments that those images might normally be surrounded with. And I was maybe particularly interested almost in the history of ways in which those archival materials had not only represented a kind of ideological position when they and where they were produced institutionally, but also about their reuse. You know, the fact that I had seen these things in other contexts with other arguments. Um, but those other contexts and other arguments weren't decidedly different than what the archival material actually spoke. And I, I kept thinking, well, why is that so stable? Why isn't there more sort of variety and more complication in our relationship to these, um, you could say, visual representations? And so I think in some ways I wanted to insert different positionalities, some of which you know, had um, theoretical sources, others were more um, popular culture, you know, kind of metaphoric or poetic in terms of their address, just to, you could say, complicate these sort of received um, images that have been both produced and reproduced over, you know, a, a long period of but time. But also maybe unburdening them from a particular task that they have, first to, you know, create the initial informing and then to carry you know to carry on you know certain kinds of iconic images in the second half of the 20th century which then become the coding for imperial violence the coding for racial hatred mm. the coding for you know some kind of false notion of dignity etc so it's the 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 task of taking the unframing them from whatever it was right. that they were meant to do initially, and then whatever they stood for again and again and again as a kind of chain of, 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 signification. of signification that's yeah. ongoing and self-reproducing mm -hmm. and self-referencing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, why couldn't these images do a, kind, a different kind of work? Or, yeah, why, why do they, you know, why are they so handy? And why do they pop up in so many alleged differential mm -hmm. context mm -hmm. with kind of no particular result. I mean, I think the other thing at the time in the late 80s that I was kind of struggling with was maybe the persistence 
of racialized violence, um, who has access and recourse to specific types of violence, you know, why does the state seem to have a franchise on violence, and if anyone, you know, dares to employ violence, they are suddenly, you know, subject to very, you know, harsh either categorization and or punishment, perhaps, mm -hmm. probably both. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, why does that dynamic persist? You know, it's, you know, the kinds of like information that one has access to. Is that what happens in the gap? Yeah. Is, is, is the gap is what sort of diverts the, the sort of cause mm -hmm. from hegemonic to elsewhere? Right. Is that what happens? Yeah, in the gap? And, and sometimes allows, you know, very strange metaphors to mm -hmm. creep in, like um, comparisons with natural disasters, for instance, is one of my favorites. It's sort of like, hmm, social events with social causes. Um, you have these spectacular, you know, representational images of, you know, fires, for instance, and or acts of violence, which then get recoded as something that they are literally not. You know, it's kind of like, how does that happen? You know, what, what relation possibly, you know, to a hurricane does, uh, you know, acts of um, political struggle, you know, it's like... But isn't that an issue around metaphor? The absolute kind of, of impoverishment of a metaphorical practice? It may be, yeah. But it, it's interesting how repetitive it is, how it kind of recurs, almost as though it's, you know, as though it's the most natural, you know, relation you could imagine. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but you know, what kind of imagination, what positive imagination, you know, is that, you know, evidence of, if you will. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to try to, I don't know, use other metaphors or to um, code other explications. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's interesting, sometimes maybe my mind works a little bit differently than many other people, but I, you know, sort of see and frame connections between things, which sometimes seem, um, what's, what's the good word, um, that seem almost, you know, inappropriate or eccentric, when actually, for me at least, I'm, you know, trying to weave a set of relations that hopefully reconnects, you know, in this, in the case of, say, Black Celebration, those images to um, certain social logics, you know, not um, representations or metaphors that um, are freestanding but have no actual relation to the thing that we allegedly are seeing, you know. One, an, an instance in your work that I think kind of, of instantiates the notion of a gap, there's a piece of work that's, I think, almost entirely written that's against the background of Hurricane Katrina, and it's a conversation oh, yeah, with yeah, a yeah. friend who's in East Asia somewhere? Yeah, actually, it's, I'm in Seoul, and okay. he's in the US. Oh, okay. And it was a strange kind of speaking of gaps, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I happened to be there, I flew out like as it was being predicted to happen. To New Orleans. To New Orleans. and. By the time I get there, it's happening, but it's not really being covered in the same way that it's being covered in the US. And so a friend and colleague actually writes to me to kind of describe the images and describe the representations that are happening. And it was kind of a very odd relationship to have, but on the other hand, it was also kind of, it was interesting to sort of read the image in their absence, and of course to have commentary that you know reframes those images before I actually had seen many of them. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of like a version, um, a kind of interested, you know, series of um, descriptions of images that you know you're going to see, but you haven't actually seen them. And but it's also a space of, of a certain kind of political commentary that operates at a slight distance, because it's very ironic. Yeah. Uh, it was about the only moment in that exhibition which I smiled to myself. Mm. And, um, and it creates a kind of space in which one can ironize what is actually a, a, an absolute catastrophe yeah, absolute. and a, a parallel political disaster. Yeah. 
So the, it interests me as a way of thinking about the gap, that all this is happening, because gaps are usually empty. Or figured as empty. And yeah, that, that's maybe a kind of central question. It's sort of like, what is happening when you see these spectacular images? What happens before? What happens just after? You know, what are their context in a certain sense? And so you could say that I'm supplying other contextual cues um, for, you know, these things that we allegedly already know or already have read or already seen. Um, and I, I think it's, for me, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, those gaps and maybe the kind of um, ongoing and extended history. It's almost as though, you know, I took up a project like Black Celebration in the context of a kind of intensification of a gap or kind of erasure of certain political actions as such. You know, the, again, the, these kind of bad metaphors or um, desires on the part of representational um, institutional institutions to frame things in such a way that, you know, you walk away from thinking, you know, you walk away thinking that, for instance, um, problems of racial division and class division are no longer, you know, they're, you know, things in and of the past. And there was a lot of rhetoric around that, I think, in the 80s. You probably remember some of that. Mm -hmm. You know, those problems have been resolved and a kind of return to order around capital, its institutions. Everyone will, you know, kind of find their, find their way through, you know, their own personal... By earning. By, yeah, they will earn their way into yeah. Yeah. Yeah, democracy or mm -hmm. something like that. It's like... Yeah. One, one of the things that we're not, we're not going to be able to get to the bottom oh. of, but <laughs> that I really, that I'm really intrigued by, I'm, I'm sure, you know, every conversation is sort of foisting your preoccupations on the person you're talking to. So I'm, I'm doing this to Tony. But, but um, you know, sometimes that is interesting and productive. Yeah, um, I think that's kind of, to Let's some hope. extent, it informs Let's my hope. work. Yeah. Um, so, what one of the things that really interests me is so I've been able to see four different presentations of the work in the last two years, mm -hmm. and collectively, one of the things that really intrigues me is the ability to kind of of bring about intense emotion without sentiment. And I think there's a, a film that you made about Paul Revere Williams. Yes. The L.A. architect. Yeah, the Will in the Way. And it yeah, has two parts. Yeah. And um, so you, you, might, you might describe it a bit, but this, the, it's, it's a film that feels very factual, very calm. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember after watching it thinking, this breaks my heart. The, the sort of there's there's something about the dilemma that mm. kind of very quietly emerges from from this film, and so I'm very interested in how emotional affect comes about without any sentiment, and the difference that you see between affect and, and sentiment. Wow. Well, um, hmm. So maybe maybe tell people if they haven't been able to see it about this film. Yeah, it's it's kind of an interesting film in the sense that I say sometimes I'd like to do um, context sensitive work, um, but not necessarily you know site specific. Um, this was a case where you know sometimes you wind up doing things that you don't necessarily have a preconception or imagining of doing. And this was one of those cases. I was commissioned to do a project in a house that happened to be his house, Paul R. Williams. And it was interesting that I knew a lot about his practice in a kind of evidentiary way, but I knew kind of next to nothing about him. And speaking of like humble archives or archives that are at hand, you know, I, I started researching, you know, and doing a kind of due diligence. But then I found some interesting, 
documents. There's a book that I think was published by his granddaughter, which has a kind of complicated, as I understand it anyway, authorship in that there are stories told in the first person, but they were written and edited by the granddaughter. And so I was kind of interested in that um, voice, you know, relationship and, and substitution almost. And I was thinking about the narratives themselves and what they disclose maybe about certain dilemmas um, faced by, um, in this case, African-American um, artist practitioners. And those types of questions um, have kind of become a kind of subset of the work I do. And I was interested in how, you know, these things which are on one level personal, but on the other level also highly constructed. And I'm always interested in that kind of tension, you know, something that might appear to be a first person testimony, but, well, actually it's a third person, you know, it's sort of like, um, the, the relationship to subjectivity is a kind of um, complicated one, even though certain things are modulated in such a way as to appear, you know, to be more direct than they perhaps actually are. And, there's, yeah. there's a kind of shadowiness in that work because, so Paul Williams was an African-American architect in Los Angeles who was part of so many movements and moments and important and sort of... well-known well iconic buildings, right? And, yeah. and private commissions and private, social yeah. housing and so many different things, and yet is a shadowy presence within his own work. Yeah. So, and it's that, that kind of... I, I think the heartbreak was in that, mm. that one can't fully occupy, you know, the very thing that one has made that one is shadowy within it. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and that's that's where I got kind of in, hooked on the notion of the difference between, you know, affect and sentiment. Because mm -hmm. you could have said, oh, he was denied and he was deprived. No, I, was, I don't say that. Yeah. And he doesn't, you know, yeah. in, in this accounting, he doesn't say that. He's actually very careful to produce a certain type of self-representation, some of which, you know, I think people will and have critiqued. You know, that kind of, aware, yeah. yeah, it's it's that kind of, um, how should I put it? Um, yeah, refusing to make a certain type of personal representation and pleading. And and maybe that that reluctance intrigued me, you know, it's like, well, aren't the buildings enough? And, you know, it's almost as though to talk about these things on the one hand is, I think, kind of central, but on the other hand, there is a kind of effacement in, in, the, in the telling. Mm -hmm. um, you could say, what's interesting is that maybe by representing it at a certain remove, mm -hmm. you kind of, in, a, in this weird triangulation, disclose something in the text, you know, in the methodology of the text. That I'm, I'm always kind of moving things or repositioning them in ways that sometimes actually reveals, you know, something or, or has a specific kind of emotive charge. But it's not, I hope not, sentimental. Yeah. It, but it can be affective. And that's something I think over time I've kind of come, moved towards. Um, and this might be a, a good time to also talk about the way music functions, you know, as a way of giving a particular sort of charge and direction and framing um, to something that may or may not actually, you know, have that framing. And sometimes the recognition that it's not quite spot on throws things into relief. It's almost like a, you know, a light from a particular angle makes certain surface texture, you know, visible, whereas if you lit it head on, you wouldn't see it, you know. Um. I think one, one of the things that kind of, of Mark, Mark's presence at Goldsmiths kind of, of made very, very evident was the notion of music as something through which you can have a conversation. 
So it's, it's a conduit through which a certain kind of conversation mm -hmm. takes place between emergent subjectivities that don't actually have an identity in, you know, in, 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 in reality. Mm. So it's kind of an emergent subjectivity that comes into place in the listening and then uh, has the ability to converse with other emergent right. subjectivities without anybody being particularly named as this or that or the other and given an identity and speaking as. And, you know, Mark used to do these kind of listening sessions in which nobody ever said a word. We, but 30 people would gather in the evening in the yeah. classroom and he would play things and nobody ever said anything. And when it was over, everybody went home and felt that something amazing had happened, but yeah. they couldn't give it a they name. They couldn't give it a name. Or, or a texture or anything else. And it's that, you know, the, the sort of... of, of that, that notion of the fellowship of emergent subjectivities that don't know how to name themselves. Mm. I mean, I'm interested in the idea too that you know, music is often a kind of inscription of certain social relationships, even if it's something as simple as you know, dance music and coming together to do, do that or to perform music. Um, there's a certain inherent sociality and, and kind of recognition of socialities that with recorded sound in particular a kind of allow um, multiple sort of relations um, that cross geographies and cultures and I'm kind of fascinated by you know that as a kind of discursive you know not simply you know an entertainment or not simply a way of calling people together but yeah a kind of you could argue um, a kind of zone of imagination or projection or, um, or kind of a proposition without a kind of stable notionality of identity. Um, the, the idea that you know, a, a recording can occupy many contexts, differential times, and have you know, effects in you know, places and times that are not its origin. You know, that, um, and so they have a kind of ghostly, if you will, reference and presence in the then world. You, then you also push it. So mm -hmm. in, in, in the work, um, and I, I can never remember the title's work. That's okay, I, I, that, I, that, I have real trouble with titles and names, but you know, I, I tend to remember my own <laughs> styles. Okay, so you can, <laughs> you can fill in the gaps yeah. here. So you, you describe the, it, the, and the work, I think I can play in, it back. In, in, the, in the large room that is about the use of Evil dance 16, music Torture to music. Torture, yeah. yeah. And so, but that's, that's pushing that sociality to a point of no return. Mm -hmm. And the, the sort of, of so the, that double-edgedness, you know, of being able to converse, but also being able to absolutely shut off and up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So th it's that kind of double edge that's very intriguing. Yeah, you know, in some ways it's kind of, again, this was not exactly, you know, high-level high research. Um, it, was, it was one of those things where it, it had been reported in many newspapers, and there was also a kind of beginning of an academic um, literature on this topic. And I was kind of like, what could one possibly do with this material? But there was something, you know, perhaps as a music listener and someone who feels that listening is a kind of act, music listening is an active um, phenomena or can be. It was sort of like it was absolutely, in a certain way, you know, offensive and shocking to me. And yet, you know, as, you know, the, event, the text that I eventually used points out, it was actually seen as a kind of, you know, object of derision and fun. You know, it's like, torture people with music? You've got to be kidding. And it's sort of like, well, no. I mean, there seemed to be some reportage that you know, suggested that this was a going thing. It might be horrible, but you know, it was actually a practice. And so it was interesting to me. It was sort of like, at first I thought, oh, I'm going to find some scholarly articles that really deconstruct and break down this activity and it was sort of like, well, yes and no. And 
you know, I was like, I, I had read these newspaper articles and they all seemed to have, you know, like sometimes playlists, you know, of things. And I was like, oh, gee, you know, it's like, what, you know, there, there must be something that one could do to, um, I don't know, um, reposition this material because it was sort of like there was, there seemed to be a whole lot there. And so I actually, you know, I said, well, maybe I'm not doing this right. You know, maybe someone else can do this better than I can. And at the time, I just happened to have a research assistant. And I said, can you get me as much material on this topic? Because I know I'm missing something. That there's, you know, there's got to be some, you know, some flaw in what I'm doing. And one of the articles that, that she came back with was this thing that had appeared in The Nation. And what I loved about it was that I thought I would have to collage together something, you know, that takes maybe a couple, a paragraph or two here from academic journals and, you know, accounts from newspapers and just juxtapose them. And this particular article, Mustafa Bayami's article called, yeah, it's kind of crazy. What is it? Um, disco, um, disco Inferno. And it's like, it's you know it's kind of like all the all the kind of craziness and you know are all kind of here mm -hmm. and it's sort of like well what do you do sonically with that mm -hmm. and usually the first thing i do in a piece i mean i may have a concept and i may have textual or other materials that i'm working with but it's almost like can i hear it you know or how would i um, make this, you know, legible on a kind of sonic level. And I thought, yeah, really kind of dumb and choppy relationships, um, you know, sonically, where you, oh, you recognize, you know, you recognize the song and you just get into it and then you, you sort of move on. And then gradually you, you know, maybe have longer passages of a few things and then you, you know, maybe close with a part of something. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was... I saw it in, at, at the Stedlick late at night, <laughs> and there were people in there dancing. <laughs> and I sort of, and I, I kind of looked at it, and I thought, music has lost its innocence. In, um, in, in, in a that, way, yeah. yeah. In, in that sort of, of sense, and yet they and could... Yet. And, the, and yet they could have both, right? Mm. They could kind of, of, of bop along and read the texts and in, encompass both within their bodies. And that, it's that, it's that kind of fragmentation mm. into things which are really at odds with one another. Yeah, they, they do kind of compete with one another. And it was almost as though... And they negate one. Or, yeah, and it's like, well, how come no one has noticed what, you know, what's so crazy about this, this phenomenon, you know? It's like, is there some way to bring these, you know, fragments or to fragment it to an extent where it becomes legible, how maybe horrific it is? And yet, you know, people find themselves tapping their feet or dancing to it, and it's like, that dynamic, I think, is something that's really kind of intriguing. Yeah, it's like an almost involuntary response. Yeah. 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 But the the sort of, of to be able to think in relation to an audience of a multiple set of educated involuntary responses. <laughs> and not yeah. not in a manipulative way. That's yeah. not what I mean. But the the sort of, of recognition that we contain all of those mm -hmm. and that the the sort of, of there was, there was um, the, the sort of, of, this is from, from Kojo's talk, and he says, submitting everything to the disciplining of present reality. So the, the sort of, of notion of submitting everything to the disciplining of present reality means that nothing can be fully innocent. Right. And nothing is fully evil. Not in that absolute, yeah, sense. But things do get projected, you know, as innocent or projected as, you know, lethally evil. Um, and that is an interesting, you know, again, you know, to think about, well, how is that rhetorically constructed? How is it delivered? 
Um, yeah, how is it made manifest? Um, but yeah, the question of, yeah, is there, is there an innocence? I mean, it's, it's like, one of the things that I think I find fascinating is that that's a kind of clear example of way, a way in which something that is pleasurable for one person can also be reframed and, in this case, weaponized to be, you know, really horrific. And yet, one of the things I think that the original article brings out is that it's not just the musical content. It's a whole set of other effects and claims on the body in a certain way, which I think is one of the intriguing things about the, you know, the viewer's you know, relationship yeah. to, to that it work. It surely also beat the kind of relentlessness of a repetitive beat. Yeah. Would be a disciplining, a disciplining. element. Yeah. And because and I want to maybe open up one more thing, then we'll open it to the um, that sounds great to the audience, and then we can revisit certain things. But one one of the things I really wanted to bring up because this is what I've been thinking about in viewing. You know, each each time I get a chance to see the work or different works, is the. And, I, and I, I say this in, as a form of identification because I think I also do the same and many of the artists that I'm interested in at the moment do the same, which is kind of, of produce for oneself a historical trajectory of radicality that is not necessarily one's own because one might not have been there or mm -hmm. it's another generation's or but, a different place. This this yeah. this sort of notion, and what interests me about it, and which is which is something that I think we all share, is that we don't have a place from which to begin. The what whatever critical discussion we want to launch, whatever engagement with the world we want to launch, we don't have a place to begin from, because the place that we've been allocated is one of such complicity between, you know, sort of, of neoliberal capital, mm. the legacies of imperialism, the kind of imperatives of globalization, etc. So we literally don't have a place to begin with. And I see, I, I see you doing this, I see so many people who interest me doing this, is kind of creating a chain of radical histories and saying, that's where I begin. That's a place from which I can start. Might not be mine, it might, it might may not, not be my identity, yeah. might not be my story, but that doesn't matter because I need an entry point mm -hmm. and I have no entry point. And I, I wanted to, to ask you a little bit about that because the, the, um, in particularly the big work, the compilation that I saw in Berlin, that was just an extraordinary series of moments of, you know, Detroit and Korea and 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 sort of of all kinds of of, of uprisings, of radical uprisings for different reasons. For different reasons Responding in different contexts to different, and different pressures. responses. And yet they were a chain, they spoke to one another, and they produced something for us. A, a place to, to position ourselves. And so that I, I wanted to, is that too long the chain of No, I, I think I, I get it. I mean, in, in some ways, for me, I think it is about, you know, trying to produce um, conditions of possibility for perhaps, you know, living life in a kind of radically democratic way, as opposed to a kind of hierarchized way. Um, and... I can't make any guarantees, but yeah, I'm always looking for those conditions of possibility um, and how they might be figured or reconfigured out of the, you know, strange, you know, you could say histories and cultures that we inhabit. You know, can you take a group of fragments as a kind of moment or a kind of set of tools to produce conditions of possibility for something, well, um, I would argue different and better mm -hmm. than what the situation that we have now. But there are also yeah. moments of passionate engagement. Uprisings are moments of passionate mm -hmm. engagement, whether it's rage 
or hope, mm -hmm. but there are moments of passionate engagement. And we, you know, we have no access to passionate histories. The, the kind of his, passionate histories that we inherited are nationalistic. They're the kind of passions one doesn't want to have anything to do with. So the, the sort of alternative passionate histories are, are something that are, is very elusive for us. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's like sometimes I get asked, and this is maybe not a direct response, about um, the relationship between um, anger and disappointment and, you know, the work that I do. But it's never quite kind of in, as in what you said about um, the will and the way. It's never just figured. It's kind of more a set of relations and maybe you eventually recognize this is really, you know, horrible, <laughs> as opposed to saying that at the very outset and it kind of like, well, that's, you know, it's, it's not, it's strangely passing through a kind of, you know, process, if you will, or a series of filters or a series of engagements with a subject, you realize that there is maybe, I don't know, when I was younger, I would say it was a kind of desire for a history that I could recognize and recognize myself in, yeah. But it's not, it's not an identity in a kind of, you know, traditional sense. Mm -hmm. So you could almost say an affective identity or a kind of um, circumstances where, you know, for instance, people might live together without um, recourse to, you know, violence and, but those things kind of surround us and so on a certain level, you can't pretend that they never existed and will, you know, somehow be suspended. So it's a very complicated, you know, notion and maybe deeply, you know, conflicted in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that because with the rage and the, the sort of, of utopian hopefulness, there's also a dimension of sadness. And coming from, you know, what used to be Great Britain and is currently <laughs> Little England, um, the, the, the sort of... Formerly known as Great. The, I wish there was another place that, you know, it's like the desire to be great again when one has never been truly great. How is that going to work now? <laughs> well you know, fictitious scenarios and so on. But I, I, I sort of, of, one of the things that our particular situation is making me aware now is how little we have at our disposal to actually engage with sadness, not just with rage and hope, mm -hmm. but with sadness. And I think maybe the, 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 the Polar Williams piece mm -hmm. had a, a sort of shadowy sadness to it that was inexplicit and was said, and I, I think that piece engaged me to such an extent because it was also against the backdrop of a utopian modernism, you know, mm -hmm. in which the conditions of everyday life are to be for everyone. And, um, and that kind of shadowy absence within that kind of universalism was, was very intriguing and very sad. Mm. Yeah, it is, you know, in, in certain <laughs> regard. Shall yeah, we? I mean, yeah, it's it's certainly not something to be, you know, um, jumping up and down with, you know, happiness about. Let's, let's open it up yeah. and see who wants to say it. To add to this conversation. Thank you very much for the interesting conversation. Um, I'm a historian, so I feel I have to slightly come to the, f to the defense of archives. Okay. Um, seeing as we had the very interesting comments outside um, that part of Bach is sort of the fight against fascism, and I would say that in fact archives are key to that struggle. 
not only are they incredibly democratic, if we look, for example, at the National Archiv in The Hague, or the archive of the United Nations in Geneva, anyone can walk in, it's free. On top of that, they allow us to keep government or to account, because crimes which are committed today, one way or another, they find their way into the archive, and they might be hidden for 50 years, for 100 years, but eventually they will be found out. And if we posit archives as being in any way anti-democratic, I think we will lose a key tool in the fight against fascism. So I, I think one, <clears throat> one key issue is, it's not a question of access into the archive, it's a question of who's worthy of being in the archive, who's, you know, who's not had any kind of, of presence in the archive. And that whole huge historical movement of Ecole des Annales and Alltagsgeschichte and so on, of the 70s and 80s was precisely trying to bring in all of those overlooked, humble voices of oral history that hadn't kind of made it into the archive. So I think maybe we're talking about archive in a, in a slightly different way, because what we're talking about is not accepting the archive as an absolute representation of a picture, but needing to intervene in it, take bits of this and make them talk to bits of that in order to allow more presences and, and, and more <clears throat> sort of voices to come through. Yeah, I, you know, I, I guess I, when I'm maybe thinking specifically about media archives, in terms of like access and the ability to get to and use materials. There's, you know, on the one hand, a kind of textual archive notion that, you know, makes perfect sense to me in what you say. But when I think about image archives, there always seems to be a price for the use and reuse of the material, even if it's still photographs. So, um, I don't know, in the case of Black Celebration, that material did come from an archive originally, and part of the reason why I was able to access it was that those materials were free from that archive, but there were also other institutional placements that wanted, um, I think it was $1,000 a minute in 1980s money. So it's, you know, it's sort of, so with media, it's a, it can be complicated. Free. Um, I have a question about um, why we need to focus on the sadness and why not focus on the action mm -hmm. and how archives, um, I understand the value of looking into the past in order to create something new and relevant for the present that is dynamic but how can we use that to transport us into a future that is to live as equals? Like, bring it to life. How can we, how can we dust off the archives and the hidden pieces of these archives uh, to enact and really make the world we live in in 2020 actually alive to live as equals? That's really, where, where does the, the archive of the past come into the present and the action around that? That's a good question. I mean, and I, I guess, you know, my response would also be maybe another question, and maybe that is a question of what counts as action? Um, what counts, you know, in a certain sense as, um, you could say an equally passionate relationship uh, to the past and to the construction of futures. Um, I don't know whether there is a kind of secret formula or a single way in which that might manifest itself. I think it's, you know, what's the word? It's propositional. Um, and to the extent that people can come together and imagine 
something that is a kind of um, maybe a first step, but you know it may not be recognizable as action in the kind of classical sense. Um, sometimes, yes, that does happen, um, but it may also be you know a kind of difficult and fraught set of relationships. So I'm 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 not sure what is action. I mean, you, you could say that almost any form or fora of community building that tries to take account of the past and current situations is an instantiation of that. Um, but I'm not sure whether we could agree necessarily on what qualifies you know, as action. I, I, I think maybe if I understood correctly what you were saying, I think there's an implication that sadness is passive, mm. but sadness is anything but passive. The, the sort of, of, and I think that what's so interesting about this kind of link chain of moments of uh, uprising is not a, f a flattening of the injustices and the violences that have brought them about, so not kind of thinking, oh, one violence is the same as the other, one injustice is the same as the other, but the, the way in which it positions us as legatees of those moments, and moments in which at, at one level it, seemingly things have changed, and the real sadness of unknowing that at another level they haven't, and that these sort of great operatic kind of, of uprisings um, are markers, that there's an awareness, but it's not, it's not resolution no. in any way whatsoever. And I, um, I think one of the most important things I ever saw was Okuyen Wezor's uh, short century exhibition in which he um, claimed that the 20th century had been broken into two by the decolonial movements and the wars of national liberation across Africa and North Africa. And I remember, I, I went, I, I, I tracked it around the world. I went to see it four times in different oh, places. Oh my goodness, yeah. Because it was, it completely reshaped my thinking. But I remember kind of coming home from the first time and thinking, really, did I really see what I think I saw? That he's saying that radicality the Western culture is one of Western culture's highest kind of values. It was actually something that came from Africa. And it came into the 20th century from Africa. So I started pulling down, in totally arbitrary way, biographies that happened to be on my shelves, like mid-20th century, where Sartre, Habermas, God knows what I had there. And, um, and sure enough, everybody said, I got politicized in the Algerian War of Liberation. Again and again and again, people said that. And so the, the sort of understanding of what, what is a trigger that mm. isn't a resolved set of issues, but is nevertheless a place to place, a way a to place, place oneself. A place to start. Yeah, yeah, and a place to start. So I, I don't think sadness is passive. I think sadness is very active. And there are some who believe that mourning is a kind of primary model for action and labor. Um, that it's not just, you know, wringing one's hands, it's also a kind of recognition of the kinds of things you were talking about, Erud. That it's, in that sense, it's not just personal as a kind of loss. It could be, you know, cultural and political, or a trigger, therefore. Um, Okay, I'll, very, very, very quickly. Um, could you speak more about your position towards images and their use? Um, and yeah, their issues. I'll cut it very short, that question, but I would like to hear more. And there is more about anger and, and about rhythm, but uh, perhaps later, and sadness <laughs> as well. So images, visual images. Yeah. 
That's a that's a provocative question and, and something I've thought about quite a bit. And I, you know, I can't say that I've reached a conclusion on that topic. I mean, I could imagine, in fact, I have been imagining lately, um, uses for images. But I think I reached a kind of, um, I don't know whether to call it a saturation point or a kind of stopping point in, in my own practice. Um, I, I don't know when it sort of happened, but I began to think, maybe in the early 2000s as I began the Evil series, which I haven't been working on too hard lately, but will be resuming soon. Um, you know, people sometimes ask me, when will it be over? And it's sort of like, uh, you know, it just seems to be continuing and obviously has a much, you know, longer history. But I, I reached a point for myself where I began to wonder, you know, if images were going to be, and maybe particularly because they were often images of kind of horrific and violent events, whether images in themselves or in, you know, combination or in, you know, montage or what have you, whether those images would kind of ever be sufficient to represent the catastrophes which, you know, occur in the, you know, modern world. And maybe specifically around the issue of terror, you know, it's like images of aftermaths of terroristic incidents. Um, are there ways to think about them and complicate them without playing into that ongoing sort of economy and cycle of those images. And I decided again, almost um, propositionally, well, what would happen if you, know, you the, the images have already circulated and you're not going to stop that history or that practice of representation? But is it possible to think about those images You've already seen them in most cases. Is it possible to think about their conditions of production, um, how they um, implicate us without recourse to those images? I think when I was younger, I probably would have said, um, it is necessary you know, to go through the image to thinking about the image. But at a certain point, I reached a, 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 a moment where I said, but what if you don't? Or what if the images um, are already with us? And again, people can use their imaginations in ways that perhaps are more effective than any attempt I might make to deploy those images in the strict sense. Um, and it's almost as though I became suspicious, you know, suspicious that um, maybe I was um, good at deploying them and thinking that they were having a particular effect and, and wondering if, you know, the kind of maybe relation to the image is best from a distance, you know, and, and, and that as they, you know, are processed by viewers and readers, that that actually might be more interesting and productive than reproducing you know, images of horror. I mean, I think too, maybe there is a relation to some extent to um, certain, certain theorizations of the image and its practice and effect that I became uncomfortable with. You know, it's like, well, is it really necessary to reproduce these things? Um, there's already a kind of um, long history of images of um, trauma. And there have actually recently been debates around who has the right to use certain categories of images in what context. And so it was like, well, maybe you're not obligated, you know, to um, image culture in that specific way. And I don't know. I mean, it's, it doesn't mean that I will never use images again, but it, I think it probably does imply for me that I will use images in different ways than maybe I have historically in the way in which, you know, 
others even in contemporary, you know, um, culture use images. Is, is, is using images too easy? I mean, that's what I thought at the time. You know, maybe some variation on that. But also it was kind of a, you know, I, I kind of have a very kind of strange way of thinking often. I, I, I remember also it was kind of a gesture of, um, I don't know, a repetition or, you know, solidarity with like, I don't know, 60s and 70s conceptual practices. It was sort of like, is it possible to take um, those kinds of approaches towards images, you know, including, you know, the famous, I think, Douglas Hubler, you know, the world, you know, has lots of pictures. Do we really need more of them to conduct the kinds of um, inquiry and speculation that we might want to do? It's like, maybe we don't, you know, strictly speaking. Um, they, their traces are everywhere, you know, and it's like, do you need to reproduce them in order to contest them and their power? I, I, in a I way. mean, I mean, too easy in the sense that it's instant invocation. I mean, that I think is one of the yeah things that that certainly my choice around um, the text for Selma was was kind of an an interesting sort of reflection on and of my thinking at a particular moment. It's almost like, yeah, the, you know, do you, do you have to deliver the image? You know, and you know, no matter the stake or the context, you know, the image must always be delivered. And it's sort of like, but why? You know, <laughs> it's sort of like, or what, what is it in that instantaneous evocation, let's say, of horrible violence? What, what is transmitted? You know, what is, what is gained? It, it also, there were other things that were kind of going around my head at the time, including, you know, some critiques of um, humani you know, um, images, the use of images in humanitarian, you know, or disaster situations. And it's like, oh, you mean people know they're being photographed and rather than feeling guilty, you know, flout their violence you know, to deliver that, you know, through a system of image circulation. And so it's like, it's not like you've caught me in the act of doing something horrible, although that is true in one way. It's almost as though I know this thing will circulate, and I know it will circulate more quickly than my prosecution for committing this act. You know, it's kind of a very kind of deadly and perverse, you know, relationship that I think it implies. Um, and it was, maybe I don't, you know, I, it, it's sort of like I, I want to maybe talk about other things, but the idea that everything has to have an iconic image, it's sort of like, well, I, I don't know whether that's true, you know, um, in terms of social practices and exchanges between people, um, maybe there are no iconic images, you know, of those maybe very important exchanges. And so why should you always, you know, go to the instantaneous and the dominant transfixing, you know, transfixing version of social representation? I mean, in some ways, you know, you could argue I'm, I'm interested in, you know, you could say a class of image relations but do I necessarily have to use the same tools in order to have, you know, that kind of address? Um, some, I think, would probably argue yes, you know, that they have, you know, salutary effects, and I would probably say maybe not, yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, so you, you, you just said something, the world has a lot of pictures. Do we really, really need more? And I was thinking how images are really different like from text. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last part. How images are really different like from like text, you know? Uh, yes, they are. In, I would but agree. can you elaborate Although, a little you know, bit? There, there are some people who fudge on that, that, you know, text, actually do create images both 
you know, in the reading and in their display. Just, yeah. So I'm, I'm sorry, what was your question? So you were talking about, you were talking about the pictures and how they're like different from, yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I got it, thanks. <laughs> so, I think there's one more question here, and then I'm, I'm just to counteract sadness. I want to ask about joy. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So, but there's a question. Okay. I think it's more like a comment, kind of continuing the conversations. Uh, <laughs> uh, Always welcome. Okay. It was it was interesting again that you you just opposed like Black Celebration and and, and Selma, um, because it made me think also how the conversation started about the use of the archive. And it also came to my mind uh, when Sadia Hartman, I think maybe in 2006, she has this essay, like Venus in two acts or something, uh, when she, she kind of steps away from the archive. Like in that moment, she, she mentioned something of the impossibility of finding what she was looking for in the archive because we also know who were the ones who were behind also the, the production of the archive, who were organizing these materials. And the protocols for the production of images even. You know, like, it's, it's kind of interesting. There's a, a, a video work that was produced, I think, in the late 80s or early 90s. And one of the things that it does really, really well is it kind of tells you the things that you can't see in terms of how news about violent events, you know, are produced that literally, you know, at that time, protocols are different now, probably. Um, you couldn't actually talk to the participants because they were unreliable in certain ways. And it's sort of like, oh, so that's why, you know, you can only see aftermath images and only see, you know, police intervention or military, you know, massing and patrols. It's like, the other, the other material which are theoretically possible um, are not part of a practice, you know? And, and that was kind of yeah, disconcerting, you know? It's sort of like, oh, that's why certain things literally are not, you know, visible in that particular regime. Um, now I think it is possible for um, individuals, participants in um, social struggles to self-represent, but it's, you know, you could say it's both a periodistic difference and it then becomes, you know, again, part of this logic that everything must have an image, which I'm still not, you know, able to fully grapple with. You know, it's like, why, you know, or is it more effective, you know, because there's an image accompanying it? And if so, how? You know, it's sort of like I just keep asking questions. Um, yeah. But in your work, you also kind of produce the corollary of images to consumption. And of course, that's why everything has to have an image, because it's part of the mechanism of consumption. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think you know, that it, it, it operates at several logics. Yeah. But I, I sort of, of, oh, how are we doing for time? We're not doing well. Well, that, does that mean that time is almost over? <laughs> the end of time. Um, my question relates to this notion of accessibility of language, um, because it also forms a dominant, like using the English language becomes a sense of dominance, and how do you grapple with that? With certain difficulties. <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about that precise question for a number of contexts. Um, questions of like translations and versioning are things that I'm thinking a lot about. I don't know whether, you know, it will you know, totally resolve. Um, but yeah, the question of who is being addressed in English is something that has come, you know, to me um, as a kind of, you know, live by language, die by it in a certain way. And so, yeah, how, how to move, you know, from it or 
complicate that. Yeah. But English is not one English. Yes, there are English. The, the, the sort of, of, of what then, you're talking about is, you know, international lingua franca. But English is many languages by many people to 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 kind of delve into many expressions. So I, I think when when somebody tries to solidify English English as you know the the language of imperial domination, I think and that's technological not to domination language. Mm. But I want to finish with with. So earlier, Tony and I were talking about theory as a kind of passionate practice, not disembodied, not cool, not analytical, not distance, but as an actual passionate practice because theory is critical in nature and it allows you to kind of, of speak up in a way that might not be allowed otherwise or you might not might, even, so I, might not even be possible or to translate like from and this is something that kind of always has intrigued me to kind of translate from daily life to um, discourse is not always you know a kind of easy thing or a natural thing and so sometimes actually the detour through theory is clarificatory in certain ways, mm -hmm. useful in certain ways, as opposed to just being abstract or just being beautiful language or just being, you know, um, arcane phraseology. It's actually helpful, you know, to it's imagine helpful, where it's you are. Also, you know. It's also a form of agency. It's a, yeah. I, I think of theory as a form of agency, of being able to kind of raise your voice and speak even in those moments when you know, you're not allocated a place. But what I was leading to was thinking about what something that Fred Moten said, that um, the only way to access mm -hmm. joy is to practice joy. Yeah, and, I was and thinking, that also comes up in, in Kajra's speech, yeah. yeah. And I was thinking about um, about kind of, of the, the notion of passionate theory and the practice of joy. Mm. And I just wanted to bring it up to end with. Okay. I mean, the thing that, that interests me or appeals to me about that formulation, strangely enough, actually takes us on a detour in a certain way through, through the body and, and, and into pleasure as opposed to, and, and thinking can be, you know, pleasure producing as well as knowledge producing. I always kind of question the binary, you know, between, let's say, you know, mind body, mind body yeah. um, knowledge, you know, in relationship to feeling, you know, it's sort of like, it, they're, you know, obviously they're aspects of both, and it might be interesting to combine them in certain ways as opposed to imagine their absolute separation. You know, it's like knowledge can be joyful and exchanges can be joyful, you know. It, it's not like, um, almost as the antidote in a certain way to um, sadness. You know, to have a kind of social productivity is a wonderful thing, you know. Um, I, I think, too, in terms of, you know, aspects of my own practice, it's almost like I, I do a lot of the quote-unquote mechanics and day-to-day -day things by myself, but I'm much more interested in the conversations I can have before and after those activities. And to imagine that, you know, it's only one zone or only one, you know, discourse or only one practice, something maybe that's the thing that, you know, some of my colleagues, I think, feel like teaching is, you know, a little bit of an imposition or keeps them from um, doing things that they might do with their time. And for me, actually teaching is, is kind of radically productive because it allows you know, me to maybe rethink some of the things that I might want to claim or um, hear you know, perspectives and observations that I might not hear otherwise because I'm you know, going through my files you know, and working not on my to, projects. Not to yeah. mention experiencing somebody's excitement in response to certain ideas. Thank you, Tony, for a really interesting conversation. Oh, thank you, Arid. I'm glad we finally got to have it. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you, thank you.
Thank you to everybody. And to compensate for a very brief intro, I would like to offer a little bit of an extra. <laughs> brief, however. Um, I just would want to encourage you to read th in this book, Propositions for Non-Fascist Living, Tentative and Urgent. If you want to look deeper in the um, ideas of Tiago, uh, um, there's a fascinating conversation with Denise Ferreira da Silva and Jota Mombacha and also um, Fred Moulton, who was just mentioned, um, close to the ideas. Um, I'm really happy we embarked into this um, terrain of uh, discussing joy, joy of thinking, both theory and practice. And with that, I would like to announce that uh, Tony is going to be back 19, 20, 21 March for public studies with Tony Cox. So if you keep the guidebook, you can read when, how, what, how you can uh, join us in this. Then in April and May, we will run propositions number 11. If Tony's public studies is called practice as theory, uh, prop propositions uh, 11 series uh, is titled Propos uh, propositions 11, uh, practice is theory. It's set up uh, by Rachel Rakes, who is a curator of public practice here at Buck, and Sanne Karsenberg, who uh, works here at Buck. There will be one day, I, I just want to encourage you to come back and really see the exhibition uh, properly. There will be one day that with your permission, Tony, we're going to switch off your work. It's coming uh, on Sunday, 8th of March, on the International Women's Day, uh, where we, when we're going to organize the Mama Cash Feminist Festival on um, collective X change X in uh, uh, in uh, brackets. Um, importantly also, uh, on 13th and uh, 14th of March, Iri Drogov will come back um, uh, to Buck together with the uh, European Forum for Advanced Practice, Practices, Practices, which is um, a network, a gathering of um, uh, uh, artists, curators, uh, educationists, education, what's the word? Educators, educators thank you. Um, uh, who gather together um, uh, to re uh, in this forum to think and rethink um, research, revalue the value of research, uh, artistic research included, um, and think through the propositional, the inventive um, in uh, these practices. This will be opportunities to again gather and uh, continue these conversations. This will be also opportunities where uh, when uh, uh, the basic activist kitchen, um, whom I uh, uh, would like to mention, uh, will um, uh, join. The basic activist kitchen, for those of uh, you who do not recognize it really stands for the buck. That's the abbreviation of uh, for for this uh, initiative. It's the community of uh, um, organizers um, here in uh, Utrecht. It's a project that started uh, uh, during the trainings for the Not Yet uh, within the project um, uh, convened by Jeanne van Heijswijk. Um, individuals, local collectives who collaborate, engage and prepare meals in order to share with the guests who come to Buck, much like um, today. And of course to present and discuss further their uh, respective practices and network. The Basic Activist Kitchen, I would like to re read this one sentence, is committed to community building, actualizing solidarity and mutual multidirectional care, sharing responsibility for food, the planet and for each other. Today, uh, Asia Komarova, one of the co-founders uh, of, um, of this initiative, as well as the co-founder of the Outside and Union, Outsiders Union, prepared uh, food for us, and Kass from Kritische Student Utrecht was the one who um, um, uh, helped uh, serve the food and took care of us. With this, I would like to thank again Tony Thank you so very much, Irit. Thank you for wonderful uh, conversation, and I look forward to more. And thank you, f all of you, for joining us uh, today. 
Please do come back. You're always welcome.